this Sourman Provocative Lecture for the fall of 2009. My name is Jack Estel. I'm a lecturer here in the Department of Economics. Uh, before I go further, please turn off your cell devices or other electronic devices. Um, for those of you who do not know, um, Safeway has opened a new store downtown, and so they have a table outside, um, which they're passing out bags free that have lots of valuable coupons in them, so I encourage you either before the lecture or afterwards, preferably afterwards now, that you visit them and uh, patronize them. Um, after this meeting, we will have a meeting of the, or after this lecture, we'll have a meeting of the Barstool Economist. Uh, that will be held at the Fairmont Lounge, Rotunda Lounge. And uh, we would love to have anyone who is a member or would like to be a member of the Barstool Economist, and that's everyone in the audience, to join us over there for no host cocktails and some food. I understand we might have a preferential, some preferential treatment, so I encourage you to come. Uh, even if you're a student, you're welcome to hang out with uh, some of us pretty exciting economic department people, okay? <laughs> Try to hold your enthusiasm. Um, this lecture series uh, started in the fall of 2001, for those of you who don't know about it. It's named after a fantastic professor who um, passed away unexpectedly, David S. Sourman. Um, I was fortunate enough to take classes from him, and he was a mentor to me. Um, it's the intent of this lecture series that we bring provocative talk topics to the campus and uh, provide maybe uh, different viewpoints from the ones that you've heard so often and give you an opportunity to sit back, relax, and think about those viewpoints. So I encourage you to do that tonight. Um, the format of this lecture will be, or this ta uh, talk will be, that uh, Mr. Shockmutt will talk for approximately an hour, and then we'll have about a half an hour for questions and answers. Um, and I encourage you to think of good questions and ask him, uh, see if we can come up with questions that he hasn't been asked before. I enjoy getting those, as my students found out today as I hemmed and hawed after someone asked me something. Uh, and that is what we're really all about, is asking questions that make us think, right? Sharpening our critical thinking skills. Um, we're fortunate today to have Mr. Ken Chalkman from Safeway. Ken is the Senior Vice President of Safeway, Inc., and he's also the Executive Vice President of Safeway Healthcare, LLC, which we'll hear more about. He has several core areas of responsibility at Safeway, uh, but, some of the, but his primary interest for at least us today is his um, responsibilities for Safeway's healthcare program. Um, this has been a program that's been designed and, and implemented for cost-effective integrated market-based healthcare for Safeway employees. Um, he's broadened this model to work with other companies, union trusts, government organizations and other organizations to achieve healthcare savings uh, for them as well as, health, uh, as uh, Safeway Inc. And um, using uh, this market-based approach, Safeway has managed to hold their all-in uh, all healthcare costs to nearly zero flat costs from 2005 to 2009. I also have a small business. I'll tell you, no one has been able to do that. So I am excited to introduce him tonight. Do you have something you'd like to say first, Lydia? I'm not excited for, but yeah. What? Can I make one little comment? Yes. Here. Dr. Ortega, the chair of the department. Hi. We didn't choreograph that very well, because he almost said everything that I wrote here in big print. But I'm going to say it a little bit uh, uh, tougher than Jack. He invites you to think, hell no. We command that you are here to think, folks. Uh, to think critically, Safeway has one proposal for healthcare resource allocations. Get more information. Maybe you can come up with improvements. Maybe this talk will provoke you in an entirely different solution. We have high expectations for you. I, I'm here in this one time to, to interject because what's happening right now in the Congress is of historic importance. It's critically important to you to become informed, to make your own decision, and then let your decision be heard by your representatives. 
So one thing that I wanted to do was call you to civic action. Whatever your decision, have a voice. Thank you. Oh, Safeway wanted me to remind you that they have free two-hour parking below the market garage. If you have a purchase, you get two hours free parking right below the garage, or right below the market. There you go. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, no, I was just going to say, uh, uh, I, I don't want to let it go unsaid that, uh, that Ken has a degree of, in electrical engineering, graduated with honors from Princeton, holds an MBA from Stanford, um, and serves on many advisory boards over health care, and I'm very happy to have him here tonight, so let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much both for that gracious inter introduction. One clarification to what Lydia said, the two hour free parking under our store is good only if you spend at least $50 in the store. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> but I welcome you to spend as much as your budget permits. I'm delighted to be, to be with you here this uh, afternoon and maybe just a minute or so about Safeway and why we're interested in healthcare. Uh, all of you know Safeway here in the local area, but just to put it in perspective, we're a large company. We're a $44 billion company. We have 200,000 employees. We have about 1,750 stores throughout the United States, 22 states coverage, mostly in the West, although Washington, D.C., Metro, and suburban Philadelphia as well. And uh, we have about 1,330 pharmacies. And in 2005, I read an interesting article in the McKinsey Quarterly that, uh, that was from, from the previous year. And it said that if then, in 2004, if current trends continue at their current rate, then by 2008, the average Fortune 100 company will spend as much on health care for its employees as its net income. Now that's a very strange statistic because as we all know, healthcare is a pre-tax expense and net income is an after-tax number. So comparing apples and oranges in the extreme, but it, it was nonetheless an attention getter. Uh, I'm a numbers guy. I couldn't resist doing the numbers for us. And we've stated this uh, publicly in 2005, we were spending 119% of our income in healthcare on our employees. We're a very low margin business highly unionized, have pretty generous benefits, and therefore healthcare expenses are a big deal. We were, in 2005, we were spending a billion dollars on healthcare. That had been growing at about 10% a year, so we were adding $100 million in cost each year. And um, we have this persnickety little competitor called Walmart, who doesn't give us total flexibility to raise prices to, to recover those increases in, in expenses. So, so it was pretty clear to us that we had to figure out what we could do to, in today's popular parlance, to bend our cost curve so that we could continue to offer a good set of quality benefits to our people. Otherwise, uh, we, uh, otherwise you could foresee 200,000 people being out of work and we didn't like that solution. Neither I nor our CEO liked that solution. So that's why we're interested. I'd like to talk about four areas very briefly just like to give, give some background on the healthcare challenge that we as a nation face, in, in our view. Then we'd like to talk a bit about our experience at Safeway, our point of view on healthcare reform, and what we think should, it should include and should not include, and, and finally a bit on Safeway Health, which is a vehicle through which we are helping other companies achieve the same results we've done. How many of you remember Simultaneous equations from junior high school algebra. Show of hands. How many remember them fondly? Okay. The, the essence of simultaneous equations, as I'm sure you all recall, is that you have two equations with two unknowns, an x and a y, and you need to find one solution that satisfies both equations. At the conceptual level, we believe that's, the, that's our healthcare challenge. We have two distinct challenges. We have a coverage challenge, call that X, and we have a cost challenge, call that Y. The coverage challenge is pretty clear. We have 15% of our population that's not covered by insurance, and that means that they get no preventive care, and what, and what non-preventive care they get, they get at a, at a very expensive venue called the emergency room. On the cost side, 
we have the fact that health care expenditures have been growing at two and a half times the rate of everything else in the economy for more than the last 25 years. I've actually looked at this back over 35 years and the picture is the same. A thing to remember is that although healthcare in this country is private as opposed to public, it is not a market system because there, because many of the conditions for a market system are not set. We'll talk more about that. And as a result of this, we currently spend over 16% of our GDP on healthcare. At current trends, that's on its way to 20 or 25%. And maybe more importantly, we today spend more than any other industrialized country, typically almost twice as much as a share of GDP. And, and our outcomes are not as good. Our infant, our infant mortality is higher and our longevity is no, is no greater. So we spend twice as much as a share of our national treasure and we get worse, uh, worse results than many, many other countries. Our healthcare system simply does not work. From our view, or in our view, there are two things we need to satisfy that we need to do to, uh, to fix our costs. We have to improve the health of the population. There's an awful lot of talk about prevention and wellness, and that's all well and good. Uh, but what it's really all about is changing behavior. The only way, I repeat, the only way we will cut, we will bring our healthcare costs per capita down in this country is if 10 years from now we are healthier than we are today. And what that means is that we have fewer smokers as a fraction of the population, that we have fewer obese people, and I, I recognize I'm not a poster child for that particular issue. We have fewer type two diabetics, we have fewer asthmatics, and we get there by improving behavior. If we don't do that, our, go our goose is cooked. There is no way we'll, we, we will cut costs short of rationing. And second, we need to improve the delivery system. Now our belief is that if you think about how well our market system works virtually everywhere else, I mean, think about cell phones, think about personal computers, think about flat screen televisions, even think about automobiles. In all of those cases, we have a market system. When you go out and shop for something, you pay, your, you pay for, out of your own wallet. You have pretty good insights into relative cost and quality of alternatives, not perfect, but good enough to make rational choices. And the providers who are good are rewarded because you keep coming back and the providers who are bad either clean up their acts or go out of business, and that renews our capitalist system. That is absolutely absent in retail healthcare. And if we today, on the verge of reform legislation, if we give up today on using the market to fix our problems, I would suggest that we've lost that opportunity forever, because once we go public, we will never come back. And, and that's why we think it's critical that we adopt this now. Couple of reasons why, uh, a couple of reasons why, why costs are, are rising. And think about, think about what you've been learning about market economics and the way markets work and the way you work when you go out and purchase. And think about healthcare. Oh, when you purchase a personal computer, you make the choice and you pay with your own money. There's no disconnect between the provider and the, and the payer. In healthcare, there typically is, because the lion's share of healthcare costs for most people are not borne by the individual, but are borne by their employers in this country. So there's a real disconnect. Health insurance policies typically lack incentives to motivate being healthy or healthy behaviors. Cost and quality transparency, and by that we mean insights, information about what's good, what's mediocre, what's bad, and what the relative prices of things are. You've got that for cell phones and everything else you can think about in the consumer economy, but it's not available for healthcare. And we'll show some examples of that. Providers in today's system don't have incentives, don't have very good incentives to deliver high quality results. I'm not suggesting that they aren't well intentioned, I'm not suggesting that they aren't thoroughly professional. But in today's healthcare economy, a doctor gets paid by how many things he or she does not by the quality of the output that he or she produces for the patient. And 15% of our folks are out of the system. Well, to deal with this, we have to fix all these problems. We have to have more personal responsibility in the equation to describe how to do that. We have to encourage prevention and wellness by, getting, by motivating healthy behaviors through the use of incentives. We have to get the quality and cost transparency change the way we, we reimburse our, our providers and get everybody into the system, if you will, solve the Simon Sonny's equation. We've looked at the healthcare literature 
and we've looked at what we believe are the prime opportunities for ripping costs out of the system. And we would argue that fully, well, just to uh, uh, back up a bit, we spend, we spend about 16% of our GDP on health care. That's about $2.4 trillion, of which about 1.8 or 1.9 is direct medical costs. And by direct, I mean it goes to a hospital, to a doctor, to a lab, to a clinic, and the rest is indirect, and that goes to medical research, to the VA, uh, other things. Of the direct cost, of that 1.8, 1.9 trillion with a T, best we can determine is about 15% could be ripped out if we get behavior right. And by, and by that, I mean if you're obese, you lose weight. If you're a smoker, you quit. If you're a woman, you're, you get a mammogram at, at age 40. I recognize that the, that the world just came out and, uh, and we now have the biggest brouhaha in feminine health care in decades, really. Uh, but 40 or 50, at the right time you get it and you act upon it. Transparency, you'll see in a few slides why, why, why that is critical. A few other things. Add them all up, and we believe that there it is possible to cut the nation's health care bill by perhaps as much as 40%, 45%, billion. dollars. All the estimates of health care reform and what it will cost to cover the uninsured range at about $100 billion a year. Even cut that in half if you don't believe it. It still says there's four times as much out there available to fund the uninsured than we need. And what I'll assert to you is that virtually none of that is tapped in any of the 2,000 page pieces of legislation that the House and Senate have before. Okay, let's talk about our experience at Safeway. We started on this quest formally in 2005 when for our non-union employees, and everything I'm going to talk about here, we've done with our non-union work group, which is about 30,000 of our 200,000 people. And, um, but I will say this now, that we've shared the results of this with our, union, with our union leaders, and in consequence of that, we have successfully negotiated elements of what I'm going to talk about here into the contracts that cover about half of our union, lead, uh, half of our union workforce. So another 85,000 people have some of this. We have an explicit strategy to get most of this in everywhere over the next bargaining cycle. But what we did starting in 2006 is we migrated aggressively from a classic uh, preferred provider organization or PPO plan, which, uh, which I don't know how much all of you uh, basically know about that, but it's basically a plan that has a network of physicians that you can adopt and hospitals that you can see. Uh, you have a deductible that you typically pay. You have an annual premium or a quarterly premium, and then you'll, you'll meet a deductible. And then as you, as you uh, have medical services, you will typically spend 20%. Your employer will typically spend 80% of that total until you reach some sort of out-of-pocket limit. might be $3,000 or $4,000, after which the employer will, will pay everything. That's a classic PPO plan that many people in America have today. In 2006, we migrated that people from that to what's called the CDHP, a Consumer Directed Health Plan. Now, some of you may have heard of this as a high deductible plan. It is not a high deductible plan. The essence of this plan is the following. Instead of a deductible up front, there's an account that Safeway funds. And for a family, it's worth $1,000. So on January 1st, Safeway puts $1,000 into the account. The first $1,000 of medical spending comes out of that account. The next $1,000 comes out of the employee's pocket. And then after that, there's an 80-20 split until you reach your out-of-pocket maximum. So if you think about that, it says that now as an employee, I've got a motivation of, um, to be a little bit more thoughtful about where and how I spend those monies. So maybe I have a choice of a routine bit of service. Am I going to go to the emergency room, or am I going to go to the clinic? Well, if I go to the ER, it's going to burn through an awful lot of that health reimbursement account that my employer has funded, and I won't have much of it left for later. And by the way, a provision of this HRA is that if you don't spend it, it rolls over and stays in your account until next year. So the structure of the plan now embeds just a little bit of consumerism. And we also in this plan said, look, prevention is important. So as opposed to having physicals and well baby care and mammograms and colonoscopies and things like that being split 80-20, we Safeway are now going to pay the total amount of those, of those services. So your preventive care, 
is free to you, and we encourage you to get it. And then we have this plan that has a basically consumerist philosophy underpinning it that encourages you to be more of a consumer when you make healthcare choices. Embedded in that blue line are the full costs of healthcare on a per capita basis, indexed to 100 and 2005, which is our reference point, our PPO. And by full costs, I mean the contribution that Safeway makes to the plan, plus the premium that the employee pays, plus the out-of-pocket expenses that the employee uh, that the employee incurs, and that would be either through the uh, in the form of a, of a, a deductible or the 20% coinsurance. So those are all in cost. There's no cost shifting from Safeway to the employee embedded there. That's everything. On that basis, indexing on a per employee basic basis at, at 100 in 2005, today we're at 102. And next year, based on our best estimates, we'll be at 101. So as Jack said, we've held our all-in costs essentially flat over four going on five years. The rest of the world has done that. In 2009, they're up 38%, and by next year, they'll be up 50% over where they were, again, all in in 2005. So we've held ours flat. The rest of the world has gone up between 40 and 50%. That builds a competitive advantage for us, and we're very pleased about that. If you look at what the compound annual growth rates are, ours is essentially flat, 0.2%, and the rest of the world is almost 8.5%. That's a very big difference. I'm going to tell you today that with what we've been learning over the next, over the last three or four months, and what we're planning to put in place next year and beyond, we're very confident that we're going to be able to hold our curve flat for another three to five years. And there's nothing out there in the economy that suggests that the red line isn't going to continue to go up at eight to ten percent. If you look at the difference between those two lines, the business as usual and our new plan line, and dollarize it, I would tell you that cumulatively through this year, we've saved over $150 million. And through next year, it'll be slightly over $230 million. And over half of that total has gone to our employees in the form of lower premiums than they would otherwise have had to pay. So we believe in sharing the wealth. Obviously, that's an individual company decision. But it was very much in our best interest to have our employees really see savings so that they really get excited about the value of this plan and they use it for all it's worth. The results that, we're gotten, that, that we've gotten have been driven by four critical findings. The first is that most of healthcare costs, fully 70% of healthcare costs are driven by behavior. And I said that earlier. That's the, that's, and that's a very broad definition of behavior. That's being a non-smoker as opposed to a smoker. It's getting a certain amount of exercise versus not. If you're a woman, it's getting a mammogram at the appropriate time. And almost three quarters of costs are concentrated in four disease states. Now, from a business person's standpoint, those two facts are terrific news because they're an example of the 80 20 rule, which we always look for in business, where you can get 80% of the value by doing only 20% of the work. In the retail grocery industry, we have a phenomenon called shrink. And shrink is basically everything that we buy that we cannot resell. And, and so, for example, a bunch of bananas that goes bad uh, and rotten cannot be resold. That shrink. A can of beans that is badly dented will not be sold, and that is shrink. And a package of Gillette razor blades that is stolen so it can be resold through a flea market, which happens routinely, is also shrink. So those are all examples of shrink. Now, if I told you I ran a produce department that had 600 items, and 400 of them comprise three quarters of my shrink, you'd roll your eyeballs and say, well, I don't know what you do with that guy. If on the other hand, I told you that I had the same produce department and three quarters of the shrink was in four items, it was all in watermelon and celery and carrots and green beans, it's not, but if it were, then you could say, okay, now I can afford to put somebody on a supply chain from the grower's field to my shelves for each of those four items I can really get my arms around shrink and I can control it. The same phenomenon is true in healthcare because 70% of it is behavioral and three quarters of the costs are in four areas. So what that says is I need to figure out a way to motivate behavior changes. And I say that's incentives, that's cash in your pocket if you do smart things, healthy things, 
and not if you don't. And focus in on those four disease states where most of the, co of the costs lie. Turns out obesity is an overlaying big piece of all of, of all of those four. And finally, transparency about more, more later. I keep saying that. I promise I'll tell you the story about transparency. On this chart, we show the incremental costs incurred in the average year over the lifetime of somebody who has these conditions. Incremental costs. So that says that the average smoker will cost $1,405 more per year than the average non-smoker. The average obese person will cost $1,400 a year more, and so on down the line. There are provisions in healthcare law called HIPAA, which is the Privacy Act, that says that say that a health plan may differentiate premiums up to the tune of 20% of the total premium, combination of what the employer and the employee pay, to motivate healthy behaviors. We do that this year in the Safeway plan to the tune of 20%. That comes out to $780 for an employee and the same amount for a spouse if the spouse is covered. So, so $1,560 for the family, which is real money for most people. And we apportion those savings to the four conditions shown in the dollar amount shown in blue. So a non-smoker pays $312 less than a smoker. And you might wonder, why 312 and why not 300 or 310? And the reason is that in the retail grocery industry, everything is done on a weekly basis. Our payrolls are weekly. We're constantly looking at sales in store one, two, three, four this week compared to the same week last year. It's called same store sales. It's the way things are done. So uh, the $780 comes out to $15 a week. And $6 of that a week goes to uh, smoking, and that's why it's 312. The height of these bars is the fraction of people who've been diagnosed with the condition who do not do what their healthcare providers tell them to do. It says nothing about those who haven't been diagnosed, just, just those who've been diagnosed. Um, coronary artery disease, 32%. 32% of the people with coronary problems don't do what their physicians tell them to do. Now, the, the reciprocal of 32 is what? It's 68, right? So it says the 68% of the people who've been diagnosed do what they are supposed to do. If you get a, if you get a 68 in your economic final, what grade do you get? A. <laughs> I think it's a D. And that's the best grade on this chart. Our healthcare system doesn't work. People don't do what they've been told they have to do to fix their condition despite a lot of very smart, very well-intentioned pr providers telling them the right things to do. They don't, it doesn't work. A better system is needed. We believe in Senate as part of the solution. Here's the 74%. It's concentrated in four disease states, coronary artery disease, cancer, diabetes, and a whole host of things that stem from being obese. The good news is that all four of those are heavily preventable and or manageable. Starting with cardiovascular, fully 80% of heart disease and stroke is preventable. 80%. And that disease constitutes 33% of total health care costs in, in this nation. How do you prevent it? You manage your life well, you exercise, you keep a reasonable weight, and you have a good diet. It's pretty straightforward stuff. It's what your doctors, your family of doctors have been telling you since you were out of diapers. But we don't do it. Cancer. Most, most experts now believe that, fu that fully 60% of cancers are, pre are preventable and another 30% are highly manageable if detected early and effectively treated. Diabetes is almost all type 2 diabetes, which is what's called, what used to be called adult onset diabetes. Tends to, it, it, it is driven by, by factors of weight and excess sugar that are accumulated. Uh, all preventable, or mostly all preventable, and despite the obvious challenge with, with, with obesity, most people can do something about it. So again, good news. The, the four biggies are highly behavioral, and therefore we, wanted, we want to design some incentives around it. Now let's look at the obesity overall. We further scanned the medical literature to see what experts say 
the role of obesity is in each of those four? And the answer is that the cardiovascular of the 33.7 comes from obesity. In cancer, it's not quite so much. It's, it's only a percent. Some literature might suggest it's higher than that, but we'll just call it one. In diabetes, as I said, it's almost all type 2, and that's almost all weight-related. weight, weight related. And for overweight and, and obesity, it's tautologically true. Add those up, it comes to 27%. So over a quarter of the direct costs of the healthcare system in this country today are related to weight. That says it, it's probably the biggest national healthcare challenge we have. It's the one that we are taking most seriously at Safeway. On this chart, it graph two things. The blue line is the percent of our healthcare, of our, of our GDP that is spent on healthcare. And as you'll see, it was, you know, 70% in the 60s and 70s, began to bottle up in the 80s and 90s. Now it's on a, it's on a rocket ride. Uh, with uh, uh, currently over 16, on its way to 22, 31. The red line is uh, the fraction of our adult population that is obese. It, is, it was 14 to 15% in the 60s, 70s, then bottled up to 18. Now it's on a rocket ride. Now I'd be the first one to suggest that that uh, that cause uh, that. Um, that correlation does not necessarily imply causality. I'm sure you've, you've learned that in your economics courses and in your math courses. But you can't help but wonder if there's a relationship there. And I would further suggest to you that those of you who have heard somebody say that the rise in obesity is due to genetics, I say, look at the yellow shaded area of that curve. And I assert to you that evolution doesn't happen that quickly with human beings. Maybe for fruit flies, but not for us. That is not genetic. That is behavioral. Think about now, unfortunately, most of you aren't old enough to remember what a restaurant meal looked like 20 years ago. But I promise you that the size of the portion 20 years ago was a lot, lot, lot smaller than it is today. And I also promise you that kids today get less exercise than they did 20 years ago. Uh, this chart shows obesity for all the developed countries in the world. Uh, this is a chart you don't want to win, but we do, 34%. Japan just edged up to 30, and their parliament went virtually ballistic. They are now fining employers who have any obese employees because they understand that obesity is a problem, and they don't want to let it get out of hand. Out of hand, they are 1 11th our rate. As a nation, we're doing very little about it. Why are behavior incentives important? I think about automobile insurance. I'm going to tell a fib here, and I'm going to suggest that Jack and I are both 35 years old, that we both live in Pleasanton, California, and we both drive a Toyota Camry sedan. Jack is a superb driver, always has been. He can get a full suite of insurance. He can get liability, collision, comprehensive, uninsured motors for about $750 a year. He's single, by the way. I'm single, too. That's probably not true for either of us. I'm a lousy driver. I carry three points on my license, and I have done for over 10 years. I can get the same package of insurance, but I'll pay over $1,500 for it. Why? Because of my behavior. Does anyone think that's inherently unfair? I see no hands, I'll assume no. All I have to do is clean up my act, demonstrate good driving behavior over some reasonable period of time, call it two years, get those points off my license, and the same insurance carrier will reward me with Jack's good driver rates. Behavior matters, the, insurance, the automobile insurance industry has the ability to set rates accordingly. We believe that healthcare ought to be done exactly the same way, that behavior should really matter. Think about those 1,400 incremental dollars for an obese person or a smoker. We believe that the obese person and the smoker should bear a good share of that. And we believe if he or she does, he will be motivated to improve behavior to remedy that condition, earn a lower rate, and drive costs down for both him or herself and the company at the same time. We uh, instituted a program called Healthy Measures. 
at Safeway. And Healthy Measures is a vehicle through which it's in the, it, it, our, um, our first year is 2009. It's the only way that you can earn the lowest possible premium. And to do it, it's a voluntary program, but if you want access to the lowest premium, you must partake. And what you do is you volunteer to be measured on weight or BMI, smoking, blood pressure, and, and cholesterol. We, uh, we used to do the smoking on the honor system. And we found out that we had only half the smoking rate of the nation. <laughs> what, so we now believe it's important uh, to, uh, to measure. So you stand in line, you have the inside of your cheek swab. The swab is sent off to a lab that detects nicotine residue for up, up to eight weeks. You stand on a scale, you, and your weight is taken, and you take your height, your BM, I say we, all this is done by a third party, because we at Safeway, under HIPAA privacy rules, have no right to know any particular thing about any employee, and so on and so forth. 74% uh, of the people who are in our, our, our non-union health care coverage opted into this program. Uh, we surveyed them, almost 80% say it's good, very good, or excellent. The most common suggestion for improvement is more incentives. And we've lobbied for, for that. Uh, we, we can currently go up to 20%, as I said, under HIPAA. In the, uh, in the Senate bill, there's a provision that raises HIPAA up to 30%. That uh, provision came through an amendment which is known informally as the Safeway Amendment because we advocated strongly with both the House Finance Committee and the House Health Committee. The last item is one that I'm particularly proud of. Over the summer, when Healthcare reform was being fiercely debated in both houses and committees. Uh, a lot was said about what Safeway has done in healthy measures, and some of it was said with good knowledge, and some of it was said through the old telephone technique where I told Jack and Jack told Lydia, and, 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 and Lydia told Chris, and Chris told Harold, and pretty soon Harold didn't even have the spelling of healthy measures. Uh, so a call was set up. On this call were four people from the Department of Labor, four from Health and Human Services, and two from the White House, including Dr. Zeke Emanuel, who is the second in command on the health care uh, side for the, for, uh, for, for the president. The reason the White House was involved was that President Obama had said some very complimentary things about what Safeway has done, and I think Zeke wanted to make sure that the president wasn't lying when he said that. So this call was set up. It was billed for 45 minutes. It went for an hour and a quarter. On the Safeway side was me and two lawyers across the table from me who spoke to me only through flashcards while I was on the phone. Uh, I started off by explaining healthy measures in much more detail than I've been able to do here this evening. I was then grilled intensively, you know, kind of, kind of questions like, oh, well, how would you handle this situation? And what about that circumstance? And they were really concerned about inherent fairness and were we, uh, uh, and were we applying the inherent rules of HIPAA well. At the end of the session, a, a woman from the Department of Labor who was on the call said, look, I helped draft the rules in 1996 that became HIPAA. And what you've told me, Ken, or from, from what you've told me, Ken, um, a Safeway is a good corporate citizen. And Safeway is adhering to both the letter and the spirit of HIPAA. And were I not, and this is a literal quote, were I not happily employed by the federal government, I'd be proud to be employed by Safeway. That made my day. Since you live in Washington, D.C., I just said, just please make sure you buy all your groceries in Safeway stores, and we'll call it even. But, but, my, but my point here is that it's not easy to do this stuff. The law and the regulations are incredibly Byzantine. Uh, we spend a lot of time on this with our internal lawyers and with external expert lawyers in this field to understand what HIPAA said, understand what HIPAA allowed, what it disallowed, and got the best judgment we could to determine how we could proceed. And we proceeded on, on that basis, and we made very sure that we didn't cut any, any corners. If I were to tell you that in our 30,000-odd population, that we'd had 10 complaints about this program, you would probably say that's not too bad. But what I will tell you is that we have not had a single complaint. So this can be done, and it can be done effectively. We are now in the process 
of retesting for premium, premium levels next year. And as I may have said before, when, you go, when people went through this testing process at the end of 08, if they passed the screens, they earned a, a, a lower rate. Let's take an example of someone who tested as a smoker in the fall of 2008 for 2009. They did not earn the, no, the non-smoker rate for 09. They now retest. If they are now a non-smoker, two things happen. They earn the non-smoker rate for 2010. And on December 31st of this year, we, we write them a rebate check for every incremental dollar they pay by virtue of being a smoker this year. So we're rewarding good behavior at the beginning and improved behavior over the course of the year. It won't surprise you to learn that that's a very popular feature. We are about 30, 35% of the way through the retesting process now. I will tell you that 20% of the people who tested, slightly more than 20% than of the people who tested obese or smokers last year have now passed the screens. So 20% of our smokers have become non-smokers. And 20% of our obese people have either become non-obese or have lost 10% of body weight, and we give a reward in both of those cases. For cholesterol, it's over 60%. Excuse me, for blood pressure, it's over 60% have won the, uh, the rebate. And for cholesterol, it's almost 20%. Those are better results than almost anything I have ever seen or read about anywhere. This program works, and it works well. As a result of this program, we're one of the few, perhaps the only organization, that actually has a frequency distribution of, uh, of its population by BMI. Now, I don't know who is at what point on this graph, because it's compiled by a third party, as prescribed by HIPAA. But what I will tell you is that you'll see, if you add up the three, the three segments on the right, obese one, two, and three, they total to 28%. Recall that the US average is 34%. So we, have, we are blessed with a lower than average obesity, at least for the three quarters of the people who enroll in this program. Over the summer, we launched a program called the 100 Day Challenge, through which we invited people to form up into teams and uh, to keep track on the website of the incremental activity that they undertook and the, um, and the changes in eating that they, that they, uh, that they also un undertook. And they were self-composed teams, anywhere from four to 10 people. We set up prizes, but they were trivially expensive prizes. You know, a $25 gift card, a t-shirt, that sort of stuff. At the beginning of the event, up at the, which is the top graph, you see that we had a 38% obese population in, in the 100 day challenge. That was good news for us because it said that the people who most needed help with weight were the ones who got into this program. Just the people that we were hoping to reach. By the end of the 100 days, that 38% had gone down by seven points to 31%. And all of it shifted, because obviously people moved from segment to segment right to left, all of it shifted into normal weight because the overweight fraction is the same as it was. A seven point improvement in obesity in 100 days. We're currently in a new program called the 60 day sprint because we wanted people to be, to be able to get ahead of the curve uh, as they were approaching uh, uh, the inevitable overeating cycle of uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. And next year we will have at least three of these throughout the year and we'll run them company wide. We actually ran this program here on a pilot basis with uh, our corporate people and some of our store people in Texas and some here in Northern California. But this will be company-wide three times and our intention is to improve it and to, and to repeat it to help our people manage weight challenges on board. We also formed our CEO and the CEO of PepsiCo, uh, Indra Nui, at the uh, January 2008 meeting of the Food Marketing Institute, which is the retail group, uh, uh, sort of, uh, it's a food retailing marketing group, merchandising group, jointly challenged food and beverage manufacturers and food retailers to try to do something about the obesity problem in the United States. A group of 12 of us worked for about nine months together. I was the lead Safeway person on this. And these included companies that you know well. It was people like PepsiCo and Coca-Cola and Kellogg's and General Mills and Sara Lee and um, Safeway, Kroger, Super Value, a couple of other large, large, large retailers. 
we figured out a program that will have impact for consumers in our workplaces and in, in schools. We recruited the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to help us define metrics and to keep us honest. And we now have recruited other companies. We now have over 40 companies in this consortium. We are committed to make a difference in obesity in this country on a wide scale. As part of the process of going through this, we uh, learned a bunch of stuff from many sources. And one of our best sources was a gentleman named Mark Mastroff, who was the founder and former CEO of 24-Hour Fitness. And he described to us a wonderful study that he and his colleagues did where they were sort of they were trying to figure out, is there a better way of getting people to, to lose weight than the classic thing of going on a crash diet and exercise program on January 2nd, which all of us have been on multiple times and usually doesn't take root. And Mark, Mark's work indicated that you first have to know what makes it a pound. A pound is 3,500 calories. If you want to lose a pound over a week, you have to take in 3,500 fewer calories over that week than the prior week, or you have to expend 3,500 more through more exercise than you, use, than, you, than you typically do, or some combination of changes in calories in and calories out the total 3,500. And what Mark and his colleagues had discovered is that if you educate people about their habits and identify for them some simple ways that are relatively easy to integrate into lifestyle long term, that people have a much better chance of meeting those weight loss goals. So if you want to lose a pound a week, let's say you, we, we say, okay, we're going to take in 1,750 fewer calories and we're going to expend 1,750 more. On this chart, each of those balls around the outside are examples of changes that you can make, each of which is worth 250 calories. So if you like salad dressing, go with low cal rather than, than, than a full cal, 250 calories. If you like sodas, drink diet rather than, rather than a regular, and for every two sodas, 250 calories. If you're in the habit of grabbing a monster chocolate chip cookie before dinner, don't do it. That's 250 calories and so on. There are literally dozens and dozens of other examples, and the point is find, uh, I can't read it. Sorry? 15, okay. I, I wanted you to have a magic marker, Jack. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, calories out. These are five examples of things that you can do to burn 1,750 incremental calories. You can read them for yourself. My absolute favorite is in the lower left. It says that if you push a shopping cart around a Safeway store for a little more than an hour a day, seven days a week, you will burn 1,750 calories. <laughs> Keep that in mind. And this will not work at Walmart. <laughs> Transparency, we talked a lot about that. The, the, size, the height of the bars here illustrates the lowest and highest cost that Safeway paid over 2006 to 2008 for the procedure shown here. So for a colonoscopy, and most of you are way too young to, to be concerned about that, but when you hit 50, you will enjoy this procedure. <laughs> We paid anywhere from $887 to $8,650. Think about that, more than 10 to 1. For hernia repair, $3,500 to $17,000, 4 to 1, so on and so forth. I want to show you an eye chart. Don't expect you to be able to read this, but this is the detail behind the colonoscopy chart. It shows every provider that one of our people used in Northern California, or in the San Francisco area, excuse me, between 06 and 08. And what I, if you look at the color coding of the bars, I'll tell you that the orange part, well, first of all, the purple part is the, is the doctor's fee. And you'll notice that not very much of the variation is explained by that. Now look at the orange bar, or the orange part of the bar. That's the room rent. That's the charge from the surgery center, the hospital, the hospital surgery suite, where the procedure was done. The guy on the right is getting $3,500 an hour. Now that's a pretty good business. I'd like to have that business. I don't want to pay for it. What we did in 2009 is we adopted a technique called reference pricing, in which we did the following. We worked with our 
partner who happens to be Cigna, one of the big health plans, and we said, look at your data for all your customers, us, everybody else, in Northern California. Tell us the price point at which everybody in our universe in Safeway can get a good quality colonoscopy according to your data by not having to drive more than 30 minutes. Because this is a procedure you get at 50 years old and then again at 60. We, we, we reckon it was not too much to ask people to drive 30 minutes. The answer was $1,500. So the plan today, I mean, our plan used to say we'll pay the full cost of a colonoscopy because that's preventive medicine. Our plan today is we'll pay the full cost up to $1,500. Everything over 1500 is your pocket, is your nickel, and it does not get credited against your out-of-pocket limit. So it's really your money. And we also provided information to our employees on where they could get colonoscopies at what price in Northern California. Surprise, surprise, year to date, we've had no colonoscopies more than $1,500 in Northern California. We also have not had fewer colonoscopies per month than we had in 06 through 08. Incentives work. When people have plans where choices have an impact on their wallet and when you give them reasonable access to information so that they can make rational choices, they will do it. We are now rolling out, um, we, are, we are rolling out reference pricing and colonoscopies and other procedures nationwide for 2010. I said before that we expected to be able to keep our costs flatlined for another three to five years. This is primarily why because we're no longer going to patronize the guy who wants $3,500 an hour for a surgical suite. Someone else wants to pay that fine, but no Safeway employee will, unless that employee has a lot of money and likes to spend it. Same picture for hernia. Same picture for gallbladder. Same picture for cardiac catheterization. Same picture for arthroscopy. We've done this for five more procedures, and I've done it in three geographies. Same pattern everywhere. I've talked to other employers in other geographies who have done some of this, same thing everywhere. The lack of transparency leads to a lack of competition between and among providers. And we all pay the price for it. We all as employers pay the price for it. And we at Safeway are not going to do that. Uh, we do a bunch of holistic stuff. I'm going to flip, I'm going to skip through, through this. Uh, just. All the, all the elements that we have in, in our health plan, a whole bunch, of, whole bunch of preventive stuff that we pay 100% of. We have, we have hotlines that people can call. We have a Care Connect system, which is, a, which, is a, which is a great thing. If anyone in our system, either union or non-union, 200,000 people plus immediate family, so this is probably half a million people, have a diagnosis of prostate cancer or breast cancer, we ask them to call a hotline, which is manned for us by UCSF. It will help them get routed to a hotline in their geography, so for example, Houston, Texas, and help them get linked up with a best practices provider for that cancer in their geography. This is very important. If you're a woman diagnosed with breast cancer in this country, and chemo is one of the treatment regimens, only 30% of the time do you get the right chemo and the right dose. Another 30% of the time, you get the right chemo in the wrong dose, and 40% of the time, you get the wrong chemo. The reason is that breast cancer isn't one disease, it's a complex disease. And the problem is that both of those last two outcomes lead to really lousy results. You don't get cured very well, you may die, and it's utterly unnecessary. So God forbid you get a diagnosis of cancer, or someone else in your family does, do whatever is in your power to do to make sure you get linked up with a best evidence, best practice provider. It can literally make the difference between life and death. And we're helping all of our employees to not have that problem. We're doing it for breast and prostate cancer because, that, because those are two areas that we focus on, two of the largest killers of men and women. We are expanding it to cardiovascular through UCSF. And if somebody called up and said, I just got diagnosed with leukemia, we would help them. Although we're not advertising that because we're not really set up to handle all the volume yet. Uh, we, we migrate people aggressively to generics, not, not just chemical uh, generics, but therapeutic alternatives. Uh, there's still, there's some drugs that, that aren't off patent yet for which there is not a chemical, a generic available, for which there is a therapeutic alternative 
that is a generic that gets the right answer about 90% of the time. We're migrating people aggressively there, saving, them, saving money for them and for us. Right? No diminution of care. But we have a non-smoking campus. We have a couple of Weight Watchers. We have a fitness center that's fully accessible. Gym discounts at 24 hour on Valley around the country. We do cancer research uh, fundraising. Our, almost all companies who have cafeterias subsidize the cost of the meals in the cafeterias because they like to keep their employees on campus. Uh, that means they take a shorter lunch and come back to the come back come back to the desk. We've always done that. We now have healthier choices, and we more deeply discount the healthy choices. If you if you want a grease burger and fries, you can still get it, but you'll pay full retail. If you get if you want a salad, you'll get a very deep, deeply discounted price. We're selling the same number of meals now that we were before. No evidence that we're outsourcing the Burger King through this. Uh, we formed a coalition to advance health care reform. It's a lobbying group of over 60 companies and a healthy weight commitment. That's the, that's the PepsiCo deal I mentioned. Uh, principal, I'm just going to skip this. Here are the companies that we have in our health care coalition. A lot of large companies. Uh, the, I'm sure you, you, uh, you certainly recognize some of them. Talk about policy and policy implications. I mean, health care reform is in the news right now. We believe that what we need in healthcare reform is three basic elements. We need access. People need to be in the system. And there are, and that ought to be accomplished through something close to a universal individual mandate. Um, there are a number of things in the bills that, that move in that direction. The idea of exchanges is good. The idea of subsidies for low-income in individuals is critical. You can't expect I mean, if insurance for a family costs $15,000, you can't expect someone who makes $25,000 a year buy it him or herself. It's not rational. If you want them in, you have to be able to make it affordable. It's going to be a private system. Equal tax. Change in Medicare subsidies. This is a, a none of the bills talked about this. There is a body of work that's been done at the Dartmouth Medical School up in New Hampshire. That's called the Dartmouth Atlas. And they've discovered some really remarkable stuff. They have looked at spending on Medicare patients throughout their Medicare lives, so 65 to death. And they've rank ordered the spending in each of the Medicare service areas by cost. And it turns out that places like Seattle, uh, Seattle, Washington, and Portland, Oregon are very efficient Medicare spenders. Places like Los Angeles are nowhere near as efficient, and places like Miami, Florida are terribly inefficient. Here's the interesting calculation that they did. And by the way, in these areas where they're not efficient, like Miami and LA, they're, 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 they're not efficient vis-a-vis -vis Portland, because for example, for the same conditions, people stay in the hospital longer in LA and Miami, and they're readmitted more often, and the outcomes are not better at all. As a matter of fact, there is growing evidence that the outcomes are worse, primarily because the law, paradoxically, the hospital is the last place you want to be when you're ill. And the longer you stay and the more often you are readmitted, the more likely you are to pick up secondary infections. So more spending, worse outcomes. Here's the macroeconomic mask that they did. If you were to take Medicare spending in Los Angeles, throttle it back to Portland, Oregon levels, adjusted for relative cost differences between the two, two geographies, with the money the Fed saved, they could buy every Medicare recipient in LA a 300 series BMW and be cost indifferent. Miami to Portland is almost a Maserati. This has been known for a decade, well discussed and well published. There is not a word in either of the 2,000 page bills that, that addresses it. I say shame on Congress. Uh, we need behavior change, we need personal responsibility and accountability, and we need transparency. The things that we do not think we should have, among those first and foremost is the public option. Here's why we believe that. Everybody in the health industry today acknowledges that Medicare and Medicaid are not sufficiently funded. That results in a cost shift to those of us who have private insurance. The rates that we pay in a hospital with private insurance are about 30% higher than they need to be to cover the true costs of that treatment. The reason being 
that there's a con that that the hospitals are giving uncompensated and undercompensated care to Medicaid and Medicare patients, and they have to recover those costs somehow, and they shift them to us. Same is true for doctors and labs. If you accept that and understand that, it is impossible for me to believe that the feds will fund the public option any more appropriately than they currently do Medicare. So the public option will be cheaper than private insurance. That will cause at least small businesses and medium-sized businesses to dump people out of their current private insurance if they have it onto the public option. It will also cause some big companies to think about it. Think about this statistic. In the House bill on the public option, they, they have what's called a pay or play provision. And, that, and play means you provide insurance as an employer. Pay means you pay a fee into the exchange fund. The rate at which the House has set that, 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 uh, that pay fee is 8% of payroll. We at Safeway, in our retail business, pay 18% of payroll for health care. So, so if you forget social responsibility for, for a moment, a rational economic person might say 18%, 8%. Walmart's going to go here. Maybe I ought to go there, too. Maybe I ought to get out of the business of providing health care. I promise you, big companies are thinking about that and will. So if we go public, small, medium, and some big companies will do that. That means more undercompensated care, the need for a greater cost shift. That means the cost of private insurance rises more. Eventually, private insurance gets really squeezed down and becomes a non-significant entity. When that happens, the feds wake up one morning and realize there's nowhere left to, to shift to. And then they have a couple of choices. They can either belly up to the bar and say, we're going to have to fully fund this thing, or we can finally get serious about bending the cost curve, of which there is nothing serious in the current bills, or we can ration care. There's no other way. The public option is currently construed will, we believe, unfortunately, lead to just that kind of result. I have made this pitch to a bunch of large employers, and nobody disagrees with me. I'm going to skip to here. We've looked at our estimate of bringing the currently 15% uninsured up to a reasonable level of insurance is that it would cost about $88 billion a year. And you do that through an out and out subsidy. If you do that, uh, now this cost shift that I described goes away, right? Because the hospital no longer has to shift expenses to a Safeway employee because why? Because everybody who walks in the door is now insured and they get a full payment. So the cost shift goes away. Now we've assumed it doesn't all go away. We've assumed, we've assumed about 15% of it is leaked. After all, the, uh, the doctor's lounge needs a new coat of paint and stuff. But 75 billion of the 88 billion will be recovered in cost, in cost shift going away. Transparency, we've already talked about. That's worth about 15 or 16 percent, almost 200 billion. Equalizing Medicare, along the lines I talked about, is worth a third of the current Medicare spending, about 140 billion. And then the the behavior incentives that I talked about under HIPAA at 20 percent are worth 42 billion. If it goes to 30%, it's another $21 billion, and there's some thought that it might even, even go higher. Add it all up, and you go from a negative 88 to a positive 434. More than enough to totally fund the cost of the uninsured today, and to do it without stealing from Medicare, which, which by the way, under the current bills, you know, they talk a lot about well, the CBO has said this is cost neutral, or it's acceptable. That's, um, uh, that's true, but it's, it's true only if you look at a, at, at, the, uh, at a very small piece of the world. It does not take into effect, into effect that when they cut Medicare rates, which they're planning to do, to fund the public option, that the universe shifts costs to the private sector, and we pay for it. So no way is it, is it budget neutral, at least not in any true macroeconomic sense. That is the most uh, 
the most charitable thing I can say is that it's baloney. Okay, skip that. Uh, two minutes on Safeway Health. We've started a new company called Safeway Health, whose objectives are to work with other entities, corporations, union trusts, government agencies, to help them achieve the same kinds of things that we have at Safeway. We have a pretty unusual, even unique business model. There are no fees for this service. We work on our nickel to dive in and look at, at their numbers and figure out what changes they can make. We advocate aggressively for those changes. We mutually agree before we start what their business as usual cost trend line is going to look like. We advocate for changes. They accept them or we're not. Uh, whatever they accept, we lock in. We then track actual, actual expenditures against the business as usual line and we get a slice of the savings of the difference between those two lines. Multi-year contract shared savings. Totally aligns our incentives with our clients. We don't save money for them, they don't owe us a nickel. We're currently uh, fine-tuning the contract with one major company and we are in, uh, in negotiations with three others and we believe this is going to be a very big deal for us and more importantly, we believe it's gonna be a big deal for the clients that we serve. We, as far as we know, are just about the only large employer that has flat line costs while in enhancing the value of the benefit. There is nothing that we've done that is not within reach of every corporation, every university, every government agency in this country. It just takes a little bit of will, it takes a little bit of courage, uh, and we, through Safeway Health, are going to try, are going to help other people accomplish that same thing. So, if you know anyone who needs that help, if we could help San Jose State, we'd love to do that. We'd love to help the whole, whole CSU system. Uh, it's an exciting opportunity. It's an exciting field. One final thought. The red line there shows the healthcare cost trend as a fraction of GDP that we have been on and are on now. If the rest of the country could achieve what Safeway has done and will continue to, and I don't think that's an outrageous assumption, it can be done, it'll be disruptive as places. I mean, think about it, if you bring Miami to Portland, Oregon's levels, there are a whole bunch of hospital wings that close. There are a whole bunch of specialists in Miami that are out of work. Of course, some of them might migrate to, uh, to, to Wyoming and, and uh, help with, this, with the shortage of primary care docs there, which we have a big problem with. But it will be massively disruptive, but we can do it. If we do it, in about 20 years, we will take the fraction of our GDP spent on health care down to where it was in 1980, about 8%. And that's a pretty exciting goal, and we think it's quite feasible. So with that, I will say thank you very much and open to questions. Well, but they're, they're not cost-effective for Safeway's employees. 
to visit. I just wondered whether you did that well on those other procedures or whether in the other cases the, the, the number that was um, good quality care according to, I forget who did the study Sigma. for according to Sigma, and within 30 minutes, did you get you know, the bottom 50% or the bottom 80% for the other procedures? Was, was the, um, colonoscopy much better than the others or the, not the same as the others? All the, all the colonoscopies that we had this year were at $1,500 or less. So they were all in the, about the bottom 20 percent, and they were all, as near as we know, they were good quality because those, those, those providers do give good quality, do provide good quality work according to, to uh, Sigma's perusal of their entire customer base. Sorry, I, I didn't understand your question first. What about the other procedures that you pointed to, the arthroscopy and the oh, okay. We have, not, we have not applied reference pricing yet to the other procedures. Okay. We will in 2010, both in Northern California and across the country. We have every expectation that we'll get the same kinds of, of, of results because, again, from Cigna's perspective, there's no one on that list at any point on that curve that doesn't do good quality work. I'm sorry, I didn't understand it very well. Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> is uh, safely doing something to provide more choice in healthier food? For example, uh, you suggested switching from sugar soft drinks to diet soft drinks. Uh, but uh, a lot of people uh, shy away from diet drinks containing as aspartame. Yep. As far as I think that's controversial. But uh, there are other sugar substitutes like xylitol. So is safely going in the direction of, of more choice in things like uh, non-sugar soft drinks? We are always looking for more options, uh, you know, but I will, and we want to provide a lot, as many cost-effective and as many cost-effective and popular options as, as we can. At the end of the day, though, you know, and this may sound like I'm speaking out of both sides out of my mouth, I don't mean to, we do believe in free choice in this country. So we, you know, if people want fully sugared sodas, they're entitled to buy them. And if our competitors are going to sell them, we have to sell them too. But our point is that, that people who may want to improve their weight ought to look to low sugar options. I recognize that there, are, that there is some controversy over aspartame, uh, and we keep looking for alternatives, but, but we're not in the business of creating a new soft drink. So essentially, we're going to be waiting for a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi-Cola or someone else to provide them. I'm sorry, who does? Virgil's. Virgil's. Has okay. Xylitol something that gives it a hung on it. I don't believe we carry that. So here's the next question. This is a very interesting. Um, I would love to see us you to adopt such a, or consider such a, a plan. That way I don't have to go and find work for safe work. Uh, but I would like to know, how is it working with your units? Because we are a union shop, and so it would have a lot of obstacles trying to implement such a program here. Uh, you're absolutely right. There is a greater challenge when you have a union population because you have to work this through the process of negotiation. But as I said, in our, in our workforce, about about 85% of our people are unionized. Most of our store workers, not all, but in three geographies, we are not union. But in most geographies, we are union. California, we are union. We have negotiated significant elements of this into the contracts of about you know, half of those people. And the way we do it is as follows. We share the results that we've accomplished in our non-union workforce with our union leaders. They get comfortable with the fact that there are no that there are no um, hidden agendas here. That these are real numbers. That the value of the benefit is better. But fundamentally, when we go into negotiations, we say, look, the pie that we have available to us in terms of, of next year or the next next three years has a fixed size. There are three ways that we can spend it. We can spend it on wages. We can spend it on health care benefits, or we can spend it on pensions. Uh, but the pie is fixed. And if you, Union, help us to control costs by adopting some of these approaches, then there's more money for wages. Or in the current environment, maybe there's more money for the pension fund because they're all classically underfunded now because of the financial meltdown. But the, our Union leaders are open to that. It's not trivial by any means, but it can be done. And uh, 
my guess is it would take it would take it, it or not my guess is I know it takes longer with a union workforce than with a non-union workforce because with a non-union workforce the company can just make the changes it believes it, it are prudent but uh, but with forthright uh, discussion on an open book basis we believe it can be accomplished in the union environment too I mean I'm I have a a conference call tomorrow with the union trust that administers our health care plan for our stores in Hawaii, and we're talking about just that thing. But it's, it's going to take longer. Yeah, yeah, um, I think you might permit. Uh, uh, regarding the group, the 30,000 or so, I believe you said, were non union yep. owners, on which the data is based. Yes. Do you think the demographics of that 30,000 is different from the demographics of the unionized workforce? And if so, do you think it make any difference to the projected cost of the future? It's a good question. I don't think it's materially different, but it is a little bit different. Our non-union, excuse me, our unionized workforce is all rank and file people in our stores. It's store clerks up through department managers and stores. Our non-union workforce has three components. It's uh, administrative employees, uh, like me. It's our store managers and assistant store managers everywhere, all 1,750 odd stores. And it's our store rank and file employees in three geographies, in Texas, in suburban Philadelphia, and in about half of our stores in Oregon. And by far the majority of the, of the people in our non-union plan are rank and file employees. So I think it's not materially different, but it is somewhat different because we don't have store managers, for example, in the union workforce. On the other hand, our store managers, almost to a man or a woman, grew up in the stores and came out of the union ranks. So it's not clear to me that they would have very different health profiles. They'd be a little bit older, uh, but, uh, but, but not necessarily a, a, a lot older. I mean, for example, we would, it wouldn't be atypical to have a produce manager who was older than the store manager. So I think, I think the, uh, I think they would be pretty comparable and I think the curve would be relatively the same, but of course, until we actually try it and bend it and have data for a long period of time, I can't assert that unequivocally. Uh, has Safeway been using, sorry, uh, has Safeway been using medical tourism at all uh, in order to cut down for large costs? Uh, does everybody know what a medical tourism is? Is there anybody who doesn't know what it is? Okay. okay, medical tourism is the phenomenon that says, rather than get this operation here in Northern California, I'm going to suggest that you get it to Singapore, and I'm going to pay, I'm going to give you a first class airfare for you and your partner and a week in a luxury hotel, and you have the operation at a primo a hospital in Singapore. And typically I can do that and save a third to half of total cost. Uh, it's becoming popular. We don't use it yet. We've thought about it. At the moment, we think we have enough opportunities inherent in our, in the universe over which we have control here so that we don't need to do it. We're also a little bit wary of the uh, problem of complications. You know, a person goes to Singapore, has, has an operation, something goes south after they've come home, uh, and the medical uh, community here is perhaps would say, well, I have nothing to do with that. That's not my problem. It's going to cost much a lot to fix it. So the answer is no, we haven't done it yet. But we keep thinking about it. If we ever ran out of opportunities here, we'd probably think about it higher. Good question. Come on, I have to be more questions. If yes, you could get information out to people on how to lose weight and keep it out there, that itself is, is a tremendous um, ability to make it happen because there is not a reason for people to change their weight. Um, I work in the fitness industry um, and there's, there's just not a reason for them to do it. Health does not promote it. If you could give it to them with, if you could give it to them with some kind of monetary issue right. where they could save money, I think that, that that's something that would promote a, a greater I think you're absolutely right, and of course, what we do is we do provide incentives. It's, you know, it's it's three hundred twelve dollars. Uh, when the HIPAA rule goes up to thirty percent, we'll have more to play with there. Three hundred might grow to four hundred fifty. 
we find that that we find that that's pretty effective. That that that, that having that much of an incentive, especially if it's you know if it's an employee and, and a spouse, uh, it, it's real money for a family, and it does motivate change. As I was mentioning, 20% of the people who clocked in as obese for 2009 who have retested have, have come in as non-obese. So we have motivated a change in 20% of the people who have retested, and that's about, about a third of our people have retested so far. So we, we agree that information is important. We, we, we believe with respect that incentives are more powerful than just information, and so that's where we're uh, spending a lot of our emphasis. So I'm curious, you're doing some things that I have never seen done before. Um, it, and are you finding, or, or what things have you have you found that you didn't expect, or the, are there things that you found that you didn't expect? Uh, what things have we found that we didn't expect? Um, I'm very surprised that we have had not a single complaint about our Healthy Measures program. I would have expected that we would have had some. We had some misunderstanding of it, which accounts for some of the 26% of the people who chose not to enroll, and because some people were concerned that maybe someone in Safeway Human Resources would have access to the information that they about their weight or their cholesterol, and of course that's not the case. We would, we are not allowed to have that information under HIPAA, and we've gone to great lengths too for this year to make it more clear to people that that information is absolutely privacy or protected, it's collated uh, by a third party that Safeway doesn't see it. So I've, I've been surprised by that a bit. Um, you know, I guess I'd, I guess I'd say that's, that's about the only thing I've been surprised at. We, uh, we are really blessed in Safeway with our CEO, Steve Bird, who is, both a very smart guy and a very passionate guy on this topic. And, and any of you who have worked in organizations know that if your boss is passionate about something, you can get a heck of a lot done. And so I think we've accomplished a lot and more quickly than other organizations. I mean, in 2005, we had, we had a very routine garden variety approach to healthcare to our employees. We are now being routinely touted as best in class. And we're very proud of that. I mean, it's taken a lot of hard work, uh, but that hard work has been much eased by the fact that our CEO says, go do it. And you know, as an example, when I talked about the Healthy Measures program and the fact that to get the, the, the lowest premium you had to have your cheek swap. Steve Bird was first in line. I mean, it, it, it's not something that, that applies just to the clerks and not the CEO. I mean, he steps up there and he does everything that we all have to do, and that's very public. Uh, he does stuff like, um, and he said this publicly, Steve's a prostate cancer survivor. So he leads town hall meetings in our corporate auditorium when he talks about the importance of if you're men of getting your prostate exam as part of your annual physical, learning about the PSA test and learning about the different kinds of techniques, God forbid, you are diagnosed. Um, so he, he, he just really, he, he walks the talk. And uh, he's actively involved at UCSF, he's on one of their advisory boards, so we get some of the, some of the people from the UCF Med School down to talk at brown bag luncheons at, at lunch. We'll put that on our internal internal system so that our store employees in Philadelphia can see it. And we just really do a lot of stuff to keep awareness of health and healthy, healthy measures and healthy behaviors high on everybody's radar screen. And I think in part because of that, we've had very little, almost no pushback. So I haven't been, I, I guess I've been pleasantly surprised by the fact that we haven't had any, but when I think for, for a moment about how passionate my boss is about this, the explanation for it is, is, uh, is pretty apparent. I'm just wondering if uh, the transparency that you've shown here has been the transparency on the patient side, but uh, I'm wondering as you do more of that, will you see some transparency that gets reflected in the delivery side? Where, should do, should where do. Where people will actually see what their charges is charges are, I realize that people are, are, are price shopping. Yeah, and that will, that will draw, you know, 
Part of the reason we have some of those high costs is that we have excess capacity in our systems. I mean, every hospital in this country feels it has to be able to do everything. So we have medical equipment that's underutilized. Um, there was, there was a, uh, a very interesting piece uh, last evening on All Things Considered. I don't know if any of you may, may, have, may, may have heard this. It was about transparency, but an application of transparency I hadn't heard about before. They were talking about the relative price of getting an MRI in New Haven, Connecticut, in Japan. And the guy who was talking about it in New Haven, uh, Connecticut, was presumably a very knowledgeable person. He was a health economist and an MD, and he was on the faculty of Yale Medical School, the Yale Graduate School of Management, and Yale College, in the Department of Economics. And he just, he said, well, yeah, it costs a little over $1,700. And he said, and frankly, I don't have a clue as to why it costs $1,700, a presumably knowledgeable person. The gentleman in Tokyo, a radiologist, said it cost $160, excuse me, I don't know if it was Tokyo or not, in Japan. It cost $160 in Japan, less than 10%. Uh, and the, 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 the reporter asked, well, how can that be? And he, he offered two points. He said, first, in the United States, you have a desire to have the newest and bestest pieces of equipment with the most bells and whistles available. In Japan, our equipment is a little bit older and has fewer bells and wickles, bells and whistles, I'm not sure what they do, and it's cheaper. So the cost of the unit is less. Secondly, he said we pay our radiologists a lot less in Japan than you do in, 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 in the, the United States. And the third one, and here's the kicker, said, and the Japanese government sets the price in Japan at $160. And the uh, reporter said, well, it's all fine and good to set the price, but, but how about the costs? I mean, you can't you have to make money, don't you? And he said, oh, yeah, well, you, the medical device manufacturers will sell the equipment cheaper in Japan than they will in, 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 in the United States. Same piece of gear will be cheaper. So we not only subsidize the cost of all pharmaceutical research of the world in the United States, because as you probably know, a pill of anything costs a lot more here than it does in Canada or Germany or France or the UK. We, we Americans fund the cost of all pharmaceutical R&D for the world. It would appear that we fund a lot of product uh, development for medical uh, devices as well, at least based on that one insight I gleaned about 24 hours ago. I'm in the process of tracking down that reporter to find out if she has more than one example, see if it's a general truth. It's first I've heard it transparency at that level. 1700 bucks, $160. Interestingly, about the same range as for colonoscopies for us, about 10 minutes. Do, as you mentioned, wait, 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 wait. Oh, sorry. We have one here and then, I'll, then you. I'm sorry. Uh, I do have a question. Safeway seems like you have a lot of programs uh, to offer with this new flat hat, just like in total. But when some of the prediction points that some of the data didn't show about three, two or three years ahead of time, do you, uh, do you anticipate that the number of people participating will increase? And I, I just wonder, like, as the number of people in, in the program increases, then the cost of the cost will increase as well. I just wonder what would be the minimum efficiency scale, and I just want to see when that cost will build up. Because I, I do think at one point, it does too many people the cost will build up. It's, good. it's a, a, a good question. I think as a practical matter, even as big as Safeway is, we are, we are minuscule in the grand scheme of things when you think about the, the, you know, the number of people in this country and the, the number of people who need to, to get health care. There's no evidence I have from looking at or from, from the rest of our population that would suggest that, that their health profiles is significantly different from the people who are currently in this plan. So I think that we can stabilize our costs for quite some time. Because essentially, I mean, if you think about that colonoscopy example, we're not going to be buying any $8,600 colonoscopy. And I'll tell you something that we're doing in pharmaceuticals, too. Uh, for people who have a cholesterol problem, the uh, almost always a, a drug called a statin is prescribed. 
And if you've seen the television advertising, you would be convinced that Lipitor, which is a blockbuster drug made by Pfizer, is the largest selling drug ever. But if you believe the uh, TV advertising, you'd be convinced that Lipitor is the only cholesterol-lowering drug worth its salt. There are, uh, and, and Lipitor is still on patent, so there is no generic yet available for it. There are two other generics called simvastatin and lovastatin, which are not the same chemistry, but have the same therapeutic outcome. The retail price of a 30-day script of Lipitor is about $100. The retail price of a 30-day script of Simvastatin is about $12. Two people, two senior people at Pfizer have told me off the record that 80% of the patients on Lipitor will do just fine on Simvastatin, despite the claims of their advertising to the contrary. Now, I don't think that. I mean, that's what advertising is about, right? You always talk about the virtues of your product, not the fact that it, by the way, is something else that just uh, only cost 10% of it. Um, but our plan now, does the following, because we, we built a tool, we've run our pharmacy, our pharmacy uh, file through it, and looked for the therapeutic switches according to a series of algorithms. So, so we know that X grams of Lipitor equals Y grams of Simvastatin equals Z grams of Lovastatin to get the same outcome for about 85% of patients. We now tell everybody who's on Lipitor, effective, effective such and such a date, we will reimburse uh, Lipitor only to the extent that we reimburse Simvastatin. Now, under our plan, for a generic, an employee pays $10. If the cost of Simvastatin is $12, uh, that means that we reimburse $2 on that script. If so, if the employee doesn't, doesn't talk to his or her doctor and take the switch, the employee copay on Lipitor is now about $98. It won't surprise you to learn that we have almost no patients on Lipitor anymore. Now, we do have a provision in there, because there are 10 or 20% of patients whose doctors have worked them through four or five different statins and for whom Lipitor is the only one that does the job. In that case, we just ask for a note from the doctor that documents that, and we'll give them back an old normal copay so they can continue on Lipitor at a normal rate. We're doing that in about eight drug categories now. There are about 12 more that we have available to us and will go to. So there's just so much out there that we haven't yet tapped, and we intend to, that I'm very confident that we're gonna be able to hold the cost down because we'll be doing more different things with more people, which in itself should overpower any, any tendency for the cost curve to begin to flex up. Uh, my question is about um, your recommendations for the national policy. I mean, you, you, you did recognize that we, we have a, a country of choice, and I think one of the things that's so fantastic about the program is that it is a choice that you offer, that people can choose to participate in or not. But when we get into the government, then trying to institute a similar uh, policy or program, it's no longer a matter of choice. And yet you're recommending that there is a big mandate for health insurance. And I don't see how you get a government mandate without them telling you know, what, what the insurance is going to take. So I'm, I'm just curious that you've got this fabulous program and yet you're recommending government mandates. It's a very good question. And it's and and and, and you're touching on a, a very important philosophical point. Choice is important, competition is important, and the fear that you're, that you're suggesting is if we were to mandate, are we sort of mandating a certain thing as opposed to you know, allowing people to have choice? I think if there's a mandate, and we also have insurance exchanges through which people have choice, that problem goes away to a certain extent if they're buying the individual market. I also think there are ways that the government could deal with the lack of competition currently out there in some insurance markets. Um, and they could do it just by pulling back the antitrust exam exemption that they gave to the insurance companies some time ago. Uh, an example, in 1986, Safeway, this was before I joined the company, but Safeway 
was subject to a hostile takeover attack and to fend off the corporate raiders, uh, the company went private through a rapid buyout financed by Cobra Crafts Rocks. At that time, it was the largest LBO in US history. Shortly after that, the company began to sell off assets to pay off some of the debt it acquired to go in private. So we sold off our business in Australia and the United Kingdom. We sold off our business in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And we sold off our business in Southern California, where we had a Safeway division. We sold it to a company called Bonds, which was then an independent company. The Federal Trade Commission looked at that and said that that sale would create insufficient competition in some sub-markets. Because if you think about the grocery business, it's not about a state or a region, it's basically about a two or three mile disc around the store, because that's the relevant competitive area. And what they said to Bonds and Safeway was, you have to sell some of those acquired assets to other players in Southern California before we will approve the sale. Nobody ever suggested, maybe the feds ought to open a grocery store in Southern California to create more competition. It really befuddles us that the feds don't take back the antitrust exemption that was awarded to health insurers and say, look, if, if Aetna has too dominant a market share in, I don't know, Nebraska, I'm making this up, I, I don't know, require them to sell some of their business to Cigna or United or Humana create competition by using mechanisms that are routinely applied in other industries when the concentration is deemed to be uncompetitive. Um, that's not being talked about in Washington either. So I, I, it's important that we get everybody in the system. If you go back to the time of Francis Lake, I mean, the alternative is to say to people, and that might even involve some of you in this audience, because, because at least some of you I mean, I'm accepting faculty now, but some of you are in a segment we euphemistically call the young and immortal, who don't necessarily think they need health insurance because you haven't had any chronic illnesses and you think you're going to live forever. Uh, we think that you should be required to have insurance, that you should contribute to the insurance pool. Because uh, someday you will be an old fart like me and you'll need it. Um, but I don't think that's inconsistent with, uh, with with free choice. I think there have to be options, but I, I would never suggest, and we would never suggest that you ought to be required to buy this policy. Is that responsive to your question? I think that was a very polite answer. <laughs> <laughs> I disagree with it. That's okay. That's okay. We can talk later. I understand your Okay. All right, thank you. So, Safeway is a company of like, you said 200,000 people, I think, over here? Yeah, 200,000. And um, you've had a lot of success with this program at Safeway. If we were to take this and apply it to, say, the United States, which I think is like 275 million, what challenges do you think we would face that you have to learn how to deal with in your sort of smaller company application? It's a good question. Uh, would there be challenges? The it's true we have some 300 odd million people in the country, maybe 280 million adults or so, um, but they're not a monolith and they're in different uh, places and they're in different, and they would typically be in different healthcare programs now. If you did this company by company, organization by organization, um, I think that you could do it pretty expeditiously. The biggest problem would be a problem that we blessedly didn't have at, at Safeway. Um, I'm going to say something that's not politically correct here. Uh, human resources professionals typically are the ones who make decisions about these sorts of programs. And human resources people have very tough jobs. They are not typically out of the box thinkers, and they tend more to favor incrementalism than step change for very good reasons. When, when they make changes, it upsets people and they have to answer the phone. I mean, it's a very practical and pragmatic approach. So you have that, you have the fact that 
most of the time in most companies, the HR person comes into the budget review and says costs are going to go up 3% or 4%. There's nothing we can do about it. People, people wring their hands and accept it. Um, at Safeway, we had the, it was a godsend because in that our CEO wanted to keep his hands on the wheel here and wanted to help us drive us. When we started out in this process, we did not have someone at the head of HR and the head of benefits who was eager for this change. That's, that's one of the reasons why the boss asked me to lead the, lead, lead the charge. Those two individuals are no longer with us. And we have a new head of HR and, and a new head of benefits, both of whom are ACEs. Most organizations around the company, around the country, I think will not be quite so blessed. And so, they, so, so there are some people who will struggle with this. Uh, and that will make it hard, but not insurmountable. So, okay. But, but I, I don't think this is a problem of scale. There, there is nothing, I mean, if we could do it for 30,000 people, we can clearly do it for 200,000 people, although we'd have to work our way through about 400 different union contracts. It's cumbersome, but we can do it. For medium-sized companies, you could do it through standardized plan offerings from uh, half a dozen different companies offered through an exchange that were um, easy to buy and easy to administer. And most large companies and large organizations have these HR organizations. You may have to break some China to get some of this done, but it, but it can be done. Okay, I think in the interest of time, uh, I will cut it off here, but we are going to go back to the uh, Paragon. Uh, and if you have some more questions, uh, we might have a few minutes to talk about those. I encourage you to uh, uh, join us if you can, and I appreciate you coming tonight. I'd like to have one last big hand for Ben Shockley. Thank you.